There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very, very, very excited today to be joined in studio by my longtime friend and truthfully, Hollywood celebrity, Mike <laughs> Butthair, Mr. Dick Nose Catherwood. No, Mike Catherwood. Mike, what's up, my brother? How are you, man? How are you, buddy? It's fucking so awesome to see you. So you guys, Mike and I literally go back, bro, 25 years Yep. to World's Gym Pasadena, which then became Gold's Gym Pasadena, which Mike literally told me closed like two years ago, which is mind-blowing, which is like a whole old-school hardcore gym from the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, but Mike also from that became literally famous. Uh, he worked on K Rock, which is the big, the legendary uh, FM rock station in uh, alternative rock station in uh, Southern California, which is one of six point seven. Uh, I started listening to him on the Kevin and Bean show, and then he went on to work on uh, Love Line with Dr. Drew, and he does all these impersonations. And now he's got this giant personality. He's a, he's literally a Hollywood celebrity. So that's his introduction. Um, but he has an amazing story about his life. And uh, I've been on his podcast, which I've been blessed and humbled to do a couple of times, actually three times. And we've talked about all sorts of stuff from spirituality to testosterone to aliens. But Mike has a very incredible story about overcoming re uh, addiction. But before we even get into that, Mike, I really just want to ask you, because it's really topic number one, about lowering the standards of the world and how everything is just leading to mediocrity and your real thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean I, that that it's my biggest concern uh, as far as like an existential worry with, and there's so many I think people can get caught up in. But you know, I I always am first and foremost thinking about kids, right? Of course, because I was a wayward kid. I was definitely a, a nameless child, and um, I you and I both came up in the era where you saw like Reagan's America turn into where you know kind of depression was fashionable yeah in the mid 90s where you know and if, for if you're like 25 and you watch fight club you probably think oh this is a cool movie wow brad pitt's ripped um but the reality of it is like the the idea of being the middle children of society and having no purpose and ha having everything that you feel instinctively be kind of dampened was very real in the mid 90s if you're a, a, a male and you're trying to make your way um because it's in glaring like glaring contrast to the mid I'll, I'll give you a perfect example my sister and i are, are um 11 years apart i only have one sibling and uh we're we're pretty pretty divided in age and so we went to the same high school same grade school and grammar school and middle school and to see her graduating class of 1988 versus my graduating class of 1997 was so jarring because when my sister graduated high school you better believe the high school quarterback and the prom queen were the coolest and it, like there were losers and dropouts and drug addicts and they went over here and but the cool people were had the right fashion and they were muscular and good looking and blah blah yeah. blah yeah. and when i was graduating high school like there could be nothing more uncool than being good at sports right uh buff you know like a jock it, he, like everything was became like anti-society and so when i see nowadays kind of the tiktok culture embracing the idea of not pushing through discomfort not uh aspiring not being type a not being ambitious you know that really worries me because i go like this is not at the very the very least, the one thing you and I had to fall back on was that society was, it, for the first time, kind of really embracing the idea of mental illness and depression. 
but it was not cool. No. Everyone collectively agreed. It's like Kurt Cobain started it all right. and it became fashionable. But at, at the core, what well, the spark was that lit this fire was a very sad, ill man. Yes. You know, and, and w- everyone kind of got that. It was, it was like, oh yeah, ripped jeans and flannel is cool, but wait, what we're doing here is making us miserable. Right. And nowadays, I don't think that's the case. I think it's more of a, no, let's just wear this and embrace it like it's a good thing. And it's, it's very much not, you know? Yeah, man. It's, fuck, where do we go with that? I mean, mediocrity is acceptable and become fashionable. So it's like, I mean, bro, like in my line of work now, and by the way, so I graduated in 89, so we're not that far apart. And obviously I was just a couple years behind your sister. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all those things. It's exactly the same. But like with today, like, cause I just look at my daughters, right? My daughter, my uh, oldest daughter about turned 16 and my youngest daughter just turned 14. And you talk about TikTok. I mean, it is insane how victimhood is so embraced. And how our younger, the younger kids, and and I don't want to, again, I'm not, this is not across everybody. This is just certain outliers and stuff like that. But like, it really is fashionable to not be uh, personally accountable and and, and take responsibility for your outcomes. And I have to constantly coach my 14 year old. My 16 year old is because she's in cheer. She's in like really high level competitive cheer. So she kind of understands the idea of like, you got to get up early you got to put in the work, but my 14 year old, is it an athlete? She hates going to the gym. She was a dancer, but now I just, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm laissez faire, right? Like I, I lead by example. I don't push her to do anything, but like, I hear her not take accountability and she's, and it's always like, yeah, but so-and-so, right? So it's like, you, you know, they're being influenced to not be accountable. And you, you said it, I mean, like, let's be honest, like the commercials show, and again, you you and I are very big on like helping people who are, have weight problems, but like it's fine to be obese and to just accept being obese rather than it's okay to actually not be obese because the facts are you're going to have a shorter life in a right. physical vessel. Right. And, and, and another thing that I, you know, kind of went over with you and your producer in the pre-interview was how extremes are dictating the norm and the argument a lot of times people will say is like, well, we're embracing plus size because for so long anorexia was embraced. And I go like, well, wait, why, why do we have to have such an a, 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 a extreme argument of the, the fringes? Because you're right. I mean, the idea of size zero models walking the runway and women looking at that as being a positive is grotesque. Sure. But that doesn't mean necessarily that you have to be a size 16 to be okay with yourself. You know, like there, for instance, I just saw this study about how men with low testosterone in the fifties have higher testosterone than men with high testosterone naturally in 2024. Exactly. And so my, my point is, is like, we don't have to be shooting so far in both directions to, to have those right. I, I see it throughout the political landscape, and I certainly see it through the fitness uh, world, which is something that I have a lot deeper understanding of. So I always like to kind of keep it. To, I always like to stay in my lane. Yeah, and I had a hard time doing that when you know, in the kind of 2010s, I was getting paid a lot of money to go on like CNN panel shows. I had sure. I was getting a paycheck from CNN, and I was, I'd be talking about like police brutality, and and I'd say live on television, I'd be like, "Why do you care what my opinion is?" <laughs> Exactly. You know, but I see it with fitness. So, you know, I can do that, but I do see how it bleeds over. Well, people will say like, uh, we have to push for diversity and tolerance for all races. Right. Yeah. And I go, okay, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's what America is based on. Yeah. And then if someone shows any type of pushback, now they're a Nazi. Right, and I'm like, wait, wait, whoa, 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 wait, where we, we were in this frame here, and you're going from here to to extreme. I, I yeah, you know, it, you're seeing it a lot with with Israel Palestine. If anyone says anything negative about either side, either you're anti-Semitic. If you question Israel's right uh, behavior at all, you're anti-Semitic. If you question, um, you know, the the Palestinians in any way, you you hate you hate the um, the the you know of uh, uh, discriminated against class and you hate brown people and it's like whoa 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 we're talking about 
dead people here. Let's right keep right. it. Let's keep it in, in reality. You know. Yeah, I mean, like to, to, to take it to well, so to comment on that just real quick, like my version of things now is I don't talk about. Them. I, I mean, it's not like I don't know that they go on, and it's not like I don't have you know in close quarters with my you know, inner circle and VIP people and stuff like that, that we don't have these conversations, but you can't publicly talk about it because you're exactly right, dude. Like you can be people like you and I now as quote unquote, whatever people call us, you know, people ask me, dude, I was, I should have asked you, we, maybe we could even get it. It's, it's a great thread. But when people ask my daughters or even me, like, what do I do? I say, I'm an online gypsy. Right. Cause like I could say, Oh, I'm an author. You know, people, some people consider me this social media influencer or I'm this thought leader or whatever. But I mean, it's like, it's become so ridiculous. And then, you know, again, the kids with TikTok and stuff are like, oh, my dad's this. You know, so It's just so bizarre, like what you and I do. But like, I like to tell people like our friends, I'm like, we're our accountant's worst nightmares. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm certainly my accountant. Worst so, nightmare. But, but back to what you were saying, like in the fitness space, it's also become almost insane, right? Like there, there are so many people uh, vying for attention, you know, call it online attention or whatever. And so many people like just outright ripping other people's content off. And yeah. it's like, how as a younger person are you supposed to truly interpret what is legitimate, what you can follow, what you can aspire to be? Because again, they're not me and you, you know, they're not a 50, let's just call us a 50 year old, mm -hmm. you know, Gen Xer who's been around the bus or been around the block, who's ridden the bus. Who literally, as you know, Mike, and we're going to get to your addiction stuff in a second, but literally we had to read. We did have to pursue. There were not as much options. Like, look at this. You'll laugh. I know you'll appreciate this. Look at this book, bro. I still have this book. Hell yeah. I still have this book. I literally it, just it still works. It's still program. useful. Bro, I put a workout program together for 19, 2004 from this book, from Positions of Flexion, which is, you know, is a goal. Yeah. That's, that's probably the standard. They, the kids, the point why I showed that on the show is the kids today don't have that. No. And if they did, because, yeah, they can find this. There's so much distraction, bro. Like, how do they how do they discern? And they don't they can't discern because that's part of technology and like blowing people's critical thinking skills out. But like, how do they find it? That's that to me is the hardest part, because when I talk to young people, that's their biggest question is like, how do I know who to follow? Why would I listen to Mike Catherwood over Jay Campbell or Gary V? over Gary Brecca or Grant Cardone, you know, over uh, what's that other kid, the 32 year old kid who's like blowing everybody's doors off and whatever. But it, it's like, you can't, it's hard for these kids to figure this out. Yeah. And it's, it's really hard. Uh, you know, if you're 19, yeah, I struggle with it and I'm 45, I'll be 45 <laughs> in a couple months. Like I, <laughs> but I still at least have some innate ability to just tune out. Because I go like I've yeah. been I've I've actually done this and I failed at exactly. stuff that I've yeah. found my lane. I had no ability in 1999 to find my lane. I can't imagine what it must be like for a kid nowadays when when you're in it. It's like when I was in high school, having your own style was yeah. very easy to do because you were limited to say like right. ten articles of clothing you had. And yeah, like, how can I pimp this to look cool? You know. If you have a closet full of stuff and on top of that, you can go to like nine different Instagram feeds and TikTok <laughs> feeds about like how the new style is, is this They're and that. They're really targeting you with ads. You, you become, there's like this decision fatigue that's so overwhelming. And you, so I see it not only with people I work with, but just people in my personal life. Yeah. Where they'll be doing on Monday, they're like, I'm all about high intensity. Mike Mincer was a genius. And then by Wednesday, they're like, I got to do 25 cents per body part because I just saw it, you know? And I'm like, whoa, you know, like how about either or just stay the course, you know, just like give it a shot. Bro, we, it, it's funny you say that and we're going to transition to your story of addiction and overcoming it. Uh, but yeah, dude, like they don't have the ability we're blessed. I mean, you're right. I mean, we didn't we didn't have the distraction. We had this, and maybe we had Arnold's Modern Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, but we there was nothing to distract us. It was like, oh, cool, let's apply this, and then we put it to work. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, these kids, there's so much. I mean, if you're 18, 17, 16, you know, years old, and you're a football player, and you want to figure out the right program, you know, 
progressive overload periodization or something like that, bro, there's a thousand options. Yeah. And it's that way with so many things. Yeah. Like I, I actually just dealt with it yesterday. I was thinking about, I was driving to jujitsu. I was on my, in my car driving there. Right. I'm listening to a podcast of jujitsu players, like world-class jujitsu players talking about small details of how to finish guillotines. And now I'm overthinking everything yeah, exactly. I drive over as someone who has some ability under my belt. And I remember back to being a one stride white belt driving to Pasadena. I had already moved to Venice. I'm driving to Pasadena to go train with Orlando Sanchez. Orlando, yeah. And I'm just RIP. RIP. Yeah, no, yeah. My 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 man or Orlando and I I'm going to train with him. I didn't have a podcast about jujitsu. I, I was thinking about like, right. what was the last thing Orlando taught me and how am I going to just like make it drum tight. That's right. When I go when I hit. That's right. And I was like, man, if I was a white belt now, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Cause I would, yeah. I would not focus on positions and hip escapes and just like trying to stay in Mount and find my hips and everything. I would, because I'd be so caught up in, Baron Bolos and finishing like mounted triangles with like all these crazy. Yeah, bro, honestly, you, you can't. Know? The answer to what you're saying for it to go even deeper is, or the solution is, if you're a creator, you literally can't listen to other things because yeah. you will literally be so distracted you won't be able to create. I mean, I mean, it really is that case. I mean, people ask me all the time, did you listen to so and so podcast? And I'm like, you don't understand. I'm creating so much myself. Yeah. I don't listen to anyone because if I did, I wouldn't be able to create. But the problem is, it goes back to what you and I talked to on our last podcast. You're either a consumer or you're a creator. Yeah. The key is balance because you 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 want to create 80% of the time and you want to have 20% of the time to relax and maybe to watch and listen to whatever. And, and obviously you can have teams of people that will send you important nuggets. But dude, that's the problem is most people can't stop the consumption. Yeah. It, and boom, it, boom, 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 boom. It's a sign of a bigger problem i mean just like with any really uh, all-encompassing kind of mental illness yeah. you know that's one good thing though that has come out of this is like man if we were doing this podcast 25 years ago i say the words mental illness and we're quacks you know yeah. every especially right. dudes especially like macho men they'd be right like, of course oh, this turn it right off you know <laughs> and the 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 stigma has been Unfortunately, it's been diverted to other things, but yeah. it still, yeah. the stigma around that has gone away. People can openly talk about addiction. People can openly talk about how horrible they feel when they go through a breakup or a divorce. People can openly talk about depression and, and anxiety, whatever. So that I do think is a, a a big positive movement. But you, know, if you look at any kind of all encompassing mental illness or, or strife that people have, there's all you can always track it back to something larger and. When I was, and I, by the way, I say this as someone who suffers from this greatly right now. When I got into radio, I didn't think about anything else. Occasionally, I, 45 minutes, I'd carve out to go pump some iron, maybe. Right. But I was thinking about, like, how could I be better at this? Of course. And I found something that actually people told me I was good at and that I had potential. And I just, boom. And I was yep. like on the razor's edge all the time. Was I doing great work all the time? No, but I was consumed with trying. Of and I, there was, I, I had no peripheral gaze. You know, I was like those racehorses with the blinders on so they couldn't yeah. see in the other lane. Yeah. And it's got to be really hard to do that now because, you know, people talk about in the in the self-help world, the mental health world, they talk about like, well, just find your passion. It's like, man, if you're a 19 year old right now. How How do you do that when 11 people are kind of at any given moment they're purveyors of different passions that sure. you get into. You know? Well, it goes back to Mark Manson's book, not giving a fuck is a superpower. And and that's what you have to do. You have to be, you had it, you had the same, and I, and I had it too, but you have to have a singular focus and you have to be so narrow minded in the focus. And again, bro, you, bo you, you and I both know this and I don't want to swing this because I want to get into your story, but people like us, our biggest problem is our families because we're so focused at what we do. We're so good at what we do that we sometimes get distracted from like giving attention to people that truly desire and ultimately yeah. deserve our attention. Right. That's the biggest problem I think for creators today is we have, we're so focused on the mission, you know, yeah. that we lose track of like the family members that 
you know, are out there supporting us. Like I, I think of my wife, I know I give a lot of attention to my daughters now, but I haven't necessarily done that in the past, mm. you know? And so it's like, that's the problem. And so, you know, again, it all goes back to balance. You know, right. how, how can we balance our lives? How can we be accountable to do a great job of what we do, but at the same time also be responsible fathers and husbands, you know, to the people that love us. And I think that for a creator is the biggest, the biggest obstacle. Words like balance are like, or discipline or passion or drive. people, they gloss over. But the word, like, if you think about balance and all these like BS alpha male dipshits, I'll talk about like right. Bruce Lee was the, the man of balance. And yeah. But you got to think about it. Yeah. Think about anything that means something to you. Like guys like us, right? We're talking about muscle. We're talking yeah. about hormones. We're talking yeah. about family life versus work life. It's all about building muscle is genuinely it's in its purest form about balance. It's like matching the stimulus, the mechanical tension that you provide with the amount of recovery. You have to find that balance. If you train too much, there's going to be a problem. If you're sleeping three hours a night, there's going to be a problem. If you don't train enough, you don't push yourself, there's going to be a problem. You have to find, and, and there's no other way to do it besides kind of being your own lab rat. And finding happiness as a dad in 2024 is like, how can I work as hard as I can to make the life I want without being dads from the past who like when they got home from the golf course, calf drunk, like, ah, oh, we can go play catch, I guess. You know, like yeah, that was, well, that was totally true. in 1975. Like right. that was genuine. If you're a dad, if you put food on the table, no one really asked much right. of you, true. you know, and like things are different. So it's like, where do you find that balance? Yeah, no, it's beautifully well said. All right, let's talk about your story, man. Um, I mean, I'm very familiar with it. My audience probably is not, although there's a lot of crossover. Um, you know, you bared all previously um, on your on kind of your show. Uh, um, you know, we talked about this, but like, you know, maybe just because you, you you've told the story, I know a million times. Maybe just how it started and how it's still something that you know is a lifelong thing that you yeah. always have to be aware and conscious of. Um, you know, my. My addiction problem started, I think, a lot of people because their exposure to a, like real addiction, alcoholism and drug drug addiction. They they think of Dave Navarro or something, you know, or or, or Nikki Six, and that you know, it's like Dave Navarro's parents were like, slam, you know, Anthony Kiedis, his parents were slamming heroin in front of him, you know, sure. Drew Barrymore or something, and mine was like, can be couldn't be more pedestrian breaking into mom and dad's liquor cabinet in high school. You go over to a friend's house, his parents are away. And then it just progressed to the point like that my life had become unmanageable. And there's obviously a genetic component. And uh, oh, yeah. you know, science has shown now that real addicts, there's there's a difference in our brains than, you know, people who, what they call normies. And uh, I just... There was obvious, a high level for me. There was a high level of insecurity. There was a high level of intellectual curiosity. I really wanted to live a life that was meaningful, and I was constantly. I have a very sincere sense of awe with the world around me. Sure. And things weren't weren't adding up. And then I had this thing with drugs and alcohol that was always it always worked. It always enhanced my sense of awe. It always made me less insecure. And it it never it never was unless I had trouble getting them. There was no there was never a letdown. Never phoned it in. It always worked. You know, and that became the most important thing to me by far. Um, and when I was at my darkest, living on the East Coast, I was probably twenty one. Um, I was overdosing pretty commonly not like every day but to the point that i would wake up with people like providing cpr or in a in an ambulance to the enough that it wasn't that surprising yeah and i i remember having the feeling of really not being all that disappointed if i were to die yeah except for i wouldn't have drugs anymore that's crazy. That was the that was my actual feeling. And so unlike most people, I was really lucky that I always had a a, a, fr a friend network that genuinely cared. Right. 
and a family that was loving and caring and intact. But on top of that, I came from a certain level of wealth that my dad would literally like write a check. He'd be like, if you want to change your life, we're here for you. Let's send you to rehab. And it's so concerning to me that there are probably a good percentage of addicts suffering right now that just literally don't have that. Medicine. Of course. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I did, I, I, it's, it's very weird. And these kind of almost over the top schmaltzy stories you have, but I crash cars. I'd wake up with broken noses. I'd go to jail. I'd wake up in ambulances. I'd go to the hospital from overdosing and be just a butt hair away from being dead. None of that seemed to really make an impact and i was just sitting in a hotel a motel in inglewood in 2002 and i was watching daytime tv by myself like packing rocks like really low level malt liquor by myself in the middle of the afternoon uh, and i there happened to be a mirror on the like credenza at the end of the bed and i looked at myself in the mirror and then from here out Again, this sounds so corny, but I can't really remember this in first person view. I can only remember I, my only memory of this is like in a in a closed circuit camera looking down sure, on me. Sure, sure. But I just had this feeling. I have no idea where it came from. I walked over to the other side of the bed and reached in the um, the little drawer there where there was the because this is two thousand two. There, was, I didn't have a smartphone, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's nothing. Yeah, I got the phone book and I started calling rehab centers and I found one that had a bed and I called next call was to my parents and I said I I can't do this anymore I'm I want uh, I found a place that'll take me tonight and that was it do, do so, you think well do you think because I never asked you this I, I knew that story but do you think that you were divinely interred at that point that yeah you, yeah. yeah I mean I I don't I can't because as we talked about when we first got started, I like to limit things to things that I know. I don't know what God is, yeah. but I am a believer that there is some great divine unseen knowable power of the universe. Yeah. And something at that point happened. Whereas in, in the past, even though I was faced with those consequences, a lot of times I would intellectually recognize how serious they were. Yeah. It was purely intellectual. And of course, this was, of course. this was a movement of the soul, something yeah. Like that's beautiful, man. So, and I know you know this, but just a real quick, like when I attempted to kill myself when I was at rock bottom, and this was in 2011, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was driving a car like, oh, fuck, like 85 miles an hour down Silverado in Las Vegas. I mean, I didn't give a shit, like whatever was going to happen. I absolutely positively know that, you know, you call it a guardian angel, something commandeered my hands and had me turn the steering wheel and I jerked the car off the shoulder to the road and missed running into because the light was red and there was probably 20 cars, you know, who knows what would happen. I mean, I'm sure I would have if not killed myself, killed a bunch of people, but I sat there and I shook for literally 20 minutes on the shoulder of the road. And in my thoughts, cause obviously I went from like, my life is done to I'm going to rebuild. I'm going to start over. I mean, I mean, you're, there are no words for it, bro. There, 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 like you said, there, there's no way to comprehend this, to, to say it, but like when a person experiences this type of thing in their life, there's all, the only thing to define it is some sort of divine, like paranormal occurrence. And I've actually had, so I have not told anybody this other than my daughters who experienced it with me. I've had two other experiences, bro, in the last four years that can only be considered divine in that one time we were, I, I picked up my daughter coming home from cheerleading practice and dude, I swear to God, I was driving my M3 and I was driving slow. And this guy came racing down the street on the like caddy corner. And both me and my daughter were like, what just happened, dad? And honestly, like it, the car went through us. It was this lift, literally our car was invisible and we got right. moved forward in time. And then this dude was like also involved in it and he was behind us. And bro, he was like the most OG hardcore gangbanger you could ever see, like his face and his nose and his eyes. I mean, his whole body was tatted and he was crying when he drove up next to me and was like, we just had God intervene in our lives because he was like, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's happened twice now in my life. And so I know what you experienced. I mean, I have no words for it, but my daughter to this day, you know, she turned 16 in three days or three weeks from now, will tell you the same story. She's like, we felt the car go through the car, but there was no physical, like 
interference. We, you know, we didn't like die or get cut up or anything, but it was like so weird. It was literally like we got pushed forward in time or pulled forward or something. And obviously, you know, higher dimensional beings could do something like that because this is a lower density of experience. But, you know, if we get into quantum physics and stuff like that, but something like that happened. You experienced it and I've experienced it now twice. And so it's like, there's no words for it, bro. I think the way I, I thought about it was, and then kind of analyzing it with just anecdotal stuff, like you just told me, and then also experiences in my own life. The reason why these amazing stories that are kind of unexplainable and you hear the, the universe, the higher power talking to yeah. someone. Yeah. The reason why I think drug addicts, gangbangers, soldiers, you know, Victor Frankl in a, in a concentration camp. Sure. People is that circumstances break down all the natural barriers we've put up, all the distraction. You get to the point where you can actually listen. That's right. Or you're actually capable of receiving that. That's right. Um, because Lord knows I, I was, I was at a point where I had nothing else in my, I had no desire to live. I had no, uh, connection with other humans. I had no kind of ambition for, for the, the next day, let alone, you know, decades beyond. And I think that, that set me up to finally be attuned into a boy where, you know, you see, or at least you, you, you hear words from these monks in Thailand or Vietnam that right. they may meditate for hours at a time. And they, and they can talk about the experiences that they have mm -hmm. spiritually and mentally. And it's like, maybe they're just, all the other stuff, all the all the kind of haywire radiation and blocking and electrical kind of vibrational blocking that goes on with all of us, they they have the ability to shut that out and finally right. can can receive the, that information. And I, I think through a very um, difficult and probably the most uh, painful way you can, you and I both achieve that you know, through, through other ways. It comes, it does. It comes from a dark night of the soul. Speaking of what you were just talking about, you know, our friend, uh, Dr. Udu Erasmus from Udu's oil, which you and I used to drink a lot of way back in the day. Like he's now actually a close friend of mine and he lives, he's 83 and he lives in Canada by himself. And bro, I'm not kidding you. He meditates 13 hours a day. He I'd love to do that, but I don't think my wife and well, I mean, he, you know, he sold his company. Yeah. I mean, he's old now. His wife died and he's worth God knows how much money, but like, yeah. he's an amazing person. Like you, you should actually podcast with him one time just to listen to it. Yeah. It's like literally talking to, uh, the Dalai Lama. Right. I, I mean, he's most unreal. I will, I'll connect you guys, but, uh, if you just listening to him, but you're right. I mean, you almost have to hit rock bottom. You have to have like a dark night of the soul moment to where your soul is able to literally completely block out the noise of the third dimension. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, is right now overwhelming. It's I mean, overwhelming. Yeah. The, I mean, I mean, the reason that we're all in this "quote unquote" struggle, and again, you know, we could go spiritual if you want, real quick, and talk about like, you know, what a lot of people think about with ascension and all that. But the magnetosphere of this planet right now is distortion. It's mostly distortion. So, in order to block out the distortion, a person has to truly go deep within, spend a lot of time in in introspection, contemplation, meditation, or even sitting in nature. You know, you live in nature. You know, I have a big nature reserve now behind my home that I sit in for an hour almost every morning. This morning, I only did 35 minutes because it's cold. Yeah. It, 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 it's cold. But that's the key. And so, like, humans that are able to shut the noise off, to to, to shut, you know, distra the distraction, the chaos, the, the, the digital disturbance. It's like white, bro. You know what it is? It's like, you know, a lot of people sleep with a white noise machine. Mm -hmm. The planet is it right now white noise yeah and so if you can discern how to block out the white noise for a good part of your day you most likely are going to achieve you know what it is you ultimately desire that day but again it takes it takes skills uh that many people don't have and it also takes uh a, it, it, there's a time allotment right if you're a wage slave and you're slaving away and you got to be here there and everywhere and you have no control of your time which is again the great majority of humanity like it's pretty hard, bro. I my my big belief, um, and I have to. I always like to give the caveat. This I, this isn't an evidence base. There's some studies I could use to 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 kind of support it. But my big belief on why obesity is such an issue now, uh, more than ever, people will 
get into corn syrup and and plastics and, and sure I'm, I'm i'm sure all of it's probably a collection of things but the in my opinion the biggest factor is that we've never been more over scheduled right. and convenience food has never been more tasty and yes. readily available yes yes so we talk about in the west especially where you can go buy food when you want it even if you're poor in in a in the western society you you still have access to fast food in 7-eleven you know for sure and you, you're working 12 hours a day and you got kids a lot of times you know like it's a single parent and you're just you're you're pulled in 19 directions and there's a thousand calorie bolus right here waiting for you for eight dollars to me that's where we get into it because there was crap food for my mom who grew up dirt poor in east yep. l.a you know mexican yep. immigrant family yep. yep uh but she ate at home every meal with her family home-cooked. everything or, was or they provided a home-cooked meal for her to take it that was just the way of those generations and i'm certainly not gonna poo poo the as only having one child who's a daughter and a wife who mo- majority uh, very often is the breadwinner in this household yep. i'm not gonna poo poo the idea of like women and uh, the idea of overarching feminism of women getting in the workforce and doing what they want to do, I, I'm a huge supporter. But yep. we'll, I, I do think we have to analyze when there was a time and place in this country, especially where there was always a parent at home dealing with things like preparing food, of course, and 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 uh, making sure that there was a stable home life. Um, there's something to that because. When I grew up, and I look, I, I yes, I mentioned earlier that I was affluent. I grew up in San Marino. I was, sure. I certainly never knew what it was like to struggle with money yep. growing up. But I also grew up with regular people. I, I wasn't a Trump kid. You know, I, I had friends that their dad was a cop. Their friends yep. that dads were working construction. Sure. And um, every when I went to Little League in fifth grade, every one of my friends and every one of my associates, regardless of their soci economic background had one parent at home and one parent work and yeah. now i literally don't know anyone that's a single income household i, yeah. I don't have anyone in it's my impossible kitchen. yeah it's impossible and i do think that that's that's one of the bigger reasons why you just can't there's very little appreciation for food there's very little mindfulness with food when you're totally. constantly eating in totally. between things as totally. opposed to making it a, 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 a focused ritual of of consumption you know like i think that's a brilliant point i i I mean we could do a whole podcast on that i mean like you look at young people today like under the age of 25 and these are you know and not many of them are living on their own but for the ones that are bro they wouldn't even know how to make yeah food i mean mean, let's be honest like everything is doordash uber eats I i mean there is no food in their house like they don't know how to make tuna or you know, make sweet potatoes or stuff like you and I learned when we were in high school and, you know, in, in our bodybuilding background and all that, you know, we learned all those kind of things. But the average young person today literally doesn't even know what wholesome food is. I've actually heard young kids say, well, the difference between organic and not organic is that you can't put organic in the microwave, right? Like I've heard them say stuff like that. So, yeah. And, and think about I, that. this is, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, this is finger pointing at a young, but what no, of course I it's, I it's hope it's society. I hope it opens people's eyes because there's a lot of adults the same way. I always tell people, I was like, not knowing how to cook and not preparing your food for the majority of the time. Like, sure, of course, we all we have kids, and you go to a kid's party, and on the way, you're gonna they want to eat pizza. It's like, yeah, of course, of course, right. but not making the conscious effort, the overwhelming amount of time to prepare your food and have a relationship with it, and then eat it is just like. My friends who they get a little money, they they work hard, they get their career going, and then they just go buy a car. Right? right. They just go buy. They're like, I, "This seems nice. I like driving it." Right. But I, oh, the only jobs I ever had before I got into radio were manual labor jobs. The majority of them were working in garages, right? Yeah. So I, I think when, when I first I got, met you, you were doing construction. Yeah, I, I remember when I got my very first car. Yeah. And it was a 1988 uh, Ford Ranger. Yeah. And I didn't have any type of money at 16 years old, 17 years old to like go 
put a four wheel drive suspension on it, nice rims and tires and everything. But I had enough money from working the garages to uh, change the air filter here, and then I would change my own oil. Or I would rotate my own tires and everything. Yep. And because of that, now at forty five, when I go buy a car, I'm I'm really investigating how it works, and I don't immediately go like, "Well, I, that Audi's sick. I'm going to buy the." Audi. Right now, I have a 2015 Chevy truck. I love it. I was like, "This is awesome. exact. I like this. I like that yeah. size engine." perfect for me and i there's an appreciation that comes with having a relationship with what you have that's right with cars and same thing you will be shocked how much things change and it goes even farther you talk about cooking your own prepare, preparing your own food makes a magnificent difference as far as like looking good in the mirror right, that's right. over time yeah. you will start to have an appreciation and there'll be mindfulness with the food that you eat if you actually prepare it take it to the next level you go out and kill that animal right and procure it and present it to your family like that that alone that little teeny tweak when i started to either insist that the food the meat that we eat in this family is stuff that i hunted or if it's not going to be that um i have a relationship with the farmer that we get yeah. the meat yeah. from it it's revolutionary because you start to see this food as something more than just like i have 20 minutes and i'm gonna right i'm going to whole foods and there's i gotta find grass fed yeah 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 it's, it's totally true and by the way dude i mean it might be going back to that pretty soon yeah and i wonder how much of that you know there's going to be downfall with supply chains that that poop poop the bed but i also wonder how much of that is going to be a good thing i i think i think going back to a more natural rusk uh lifestyle where you have to you know it's about you know getting live game and living off the land and i mean bro let's just be honest if these things went away society would suck for about six to eight months but then the most hardy among us would be like this is awesome we are not yeah. distracted by this fucking bullshit anymore we can actually focus on what's important like our children and our wives and you know keeping our house and and, and finding like-minded people i mean again i don't want to go all conspiracy but i mean it seems like that's what's coming I mean, I, I would it, not. For th this reason too is like, wait, we become more competent. But on top of that, you'd start to appreciate people in general more. Yeah. There was a scene in Mad Men um, where Don Draper, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Don Draper was this incredibly and possibly good looking ad executive on Madison Avenue. That's where the name Mad Men came from. So these ad execs were in Madison Avenue in New York. And he was wealthy and he was handsome. And all women loved him. All guys wanted to be him. But he was this Cadillac driving, suit wearing guy, right? Yeah. We grew up in like mountainous West Virginia. Right. So he has this dream where he goes back to like this shack in West Virginia that he grew up in. And he's a grown man. And he's wearing like yep. a skinny tie and the whole thing. Yep. And his dad says, look at your hands. He says, look at your hands. Yep. So they, they, the hands of a baby. You haven't done any. There's no dirt on your nails. You haven't done any. What do you do? What do you do? You create ideas to sell people. He's like, what do you really do in a day? He's like, you make things up and people buy it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, of course, John Draper's hurt by that, right? If we were to have some, some incident that made us live a more natural life, not only would we become more competent, but you better believe you would start really appreciating the guy who was your electrician. That's you would love the chick who was a seamstress. You would fucking right. be like, I am so into what you do. Can you help me? Can you teach me? Yeah. I let me put my arm around you, man who's great at skinning game. Because I'm I I'm not familiar as a as an attorney. Um and people would start to have a lot more appreciation of of all humans. It, it, and I think that would be really beneficial because I was on a plane probably like seven years ago. And uh I I refuse to fly first class unless someone pays for it. And in television, people will pay for it. So I, I was doing this pilot that didn't end up getting picked up, but I, I ABC was flying me first class. Sure. So you first class, they, they, uh, they load you first, you know? And as someone who is not all that familiar with flying first class, you know, I was, it was a new experience. Sure. I'm sitting up there and there, and I got my Pellegrino and then <laughs> the rest of the, the plane comes on, right? And immediately I went like this. Right. Because I was ashamed that I was in first class. Yep. And I think there's a lot of people 
who feel that way because they think that people are walking by going, fuck that guy. Would right. you know, screw him. Whereas I bet I, I I know I felt that way when I was a little kid. I'd walk by that, I'd be like, Dad, check it out. They have uh they have champagne and stuff and they get and he my dad would probably go, Yeah, and if you work hard, you can have that too, son. Right. No regard for what that person did for a living or what their lifestyle would be and be like, Yeah, well, we're gonna sit over here, they're sitting over there. If you like to sit up there, you know, put your nose at the grindstone and, and grind. There was never really this judgment passed on the front of the plane to the back. And now it's a meet, like it's a real division, yeah. civil war division. You know? Well, that, I mean, that's where I was just going to go with it. It's funny. You just literally said the words out of my mouth. I mean, it seems like, again, if we, if we imagine that there's something else, there's a hidden hand controlling third density. I mean, so I look at it like when I start getting into the whole quantum physics world now, this is how I look at it. I look at it as like whatever there's seven or eight or 12 or whatever, depending on who you listen to, you know, in the quantum. And first density is inanimate matter, rocks. You know, second density is like plant life, animals. Third density is humans. What's above us? Yeah. Right? So it's like if you start looking from a top-down hierarchical neutral observer perspective and you're like, we're not at the top of the food chain. You know, you remove your like, oh, the humans are the only game in town, you know, hat, which a lot of people can't do. I mean, you got to be humble to the point of like, uh, there's probably things that can eat us. I, I mean, I mean, you, you just got to start looking at it like that. And obviously there's all sorts of rumors about, you know, reptilians and, you know, mantids and all these, you know, UFO abduction. There's so much stuff out there, you know about all this stuff now. So, I mean, like, if you really start to reason through all this, it makes sense that you should be a humble person. Mm -hmm. That you should realize that you have a gift in being alive, right? Uh, you know, because I do want to get to, like, some of your impersonation so people can laugh because this has been such a really serious podcast. I mean, but, like, the truth is, is that you said on our last podcast that I was on your show, you were talking about, you know, inclusivity and that the key is humans getting along yeah you know humans stop looking at each other over our differences whether it's skin color silly religion uh you know differences in in uh income i mean all of that stuff is fucking absurd and and and, and we really do need a unifying thing you know and i don't know what it's going to be i mean you know i'm not this guy saying we need a one world religion and a one world government obviously but if we could just get rid of all of the bullshit and people could just get along i mean it's the whole rodney king statement from way back when but that's what it is mike and it's like i don't know if we can get there without first having some sort of horrible you know reverse polarity of like you just said a civil war i mean it seems like they're engineering conflict you don't know what could possibly be going on with the haves, right? Because yeah. it's never been more of the haves and have nots. And I, I don't even mean wealth. There's just those people who really are making decisions of the people. That's who right. Are. That's right. And uh, I wish I could tell you, like, oh, there's this simple solution. One thing I will tell you is I happen to be living in Newark when 9 11 happened. Yeah. I was really lucky I wasn't living in the city. Oh, shit. Sure. But I was really close to it, you know? Yeah. And I have to tell you, and all your listeners, especially those of you who may not be old enough to have lived through 9-11. Right. New York City in November, December 2001 was fucking magic. Yeah, because everyone magic. came together. Random people hugging. Yeah. Everyone on the subway allowing older people to have a seat. Oh, yeah, no problem. Of course, ma'am. Would you like it? High five in cops, fire yep. everyone. We love you, firemen. We love you, people. I can get. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can guarantee you, crime was probably substantially lower. Right, people got this incredible, over the top, like adrenaline injection of what is really important in life. Right, because you're like, whoa, yeah, two thousand something people just right. and built literal skyscrapers just smashed into the ground. Yep. Whoa, whoa, we just. Yeah. I'm going to go hug my kid. I'm going to make sure I, I don't need to take this email right now. I'm going to go enjoy myself with the other humans. It was magic. Now, of course, I'm not encouraging there to be something of that magnitude. But if we could synthesize that feeling 
Yeah. We got to Cause that was, that was my peek into something sustainable with humans. I think something will come and I don't think it's going to be good, but let, let's just face it, dude. Like you just said it best. I mean, you have to wake up. Yeah. And if you're not awake, the planet from a vibrational level cannot move higher until enough people are vibrating high enough. Right. And so if it takes a galvanizing moment, and again, I'm, I'm not calling for it either. Like you, I mean, I, I don't want millions of people to die, but if that's what it takes to change the current animosity and, you know, anger and victimhood, let's just call it, it's really just like a gigantic victimhood vibration. That's what I call it. The victimhood vibration. If we, if that's what it takes to end it once and for all, then man, bring it on. I mean, again, I, I feel sorry for the souls that may have to be pieced out, you know, when that happens. But, you know, it, all I know is, dude, and throughout history, all great societies have risen and fallen. And America, you know, if it really was engineered to be the next Atlantis, which, you know, a lot of people have said it was, is clearly in decline. Yeah. Now, how you define decline, I don't really care. No, it doesn't matter. But from a standard standpoint, like you said, like just... Post World War II, I think you would look at like society as like a nuclear family. Like you said, you know, the people were cooking food. There was a stay at home breadwinner, not a breadwinner, but parent. Kids were being raised correctly. There was like family, there was c community, togetherness, spirituality. People went to church, stuff like that. And now all that's broken. So we're clearly not in a place that is supportive of inclusivity. It's just yeah. not. It's, and that's, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about that, the big point I always like to make to people, and I go like, I am completely impartial yeah. to the actual nuts and bolts of feminism. Sure. But one thing I will say, and I'll say it with great certainty, is that women are fighting so hard, especially young women, they're fighting so hard to be the boss bitch. I'm going to go out and <laughs> my career, my career, my career. Why? Because they think that they want to puncture the the patriarchy, right? Yeah. And uh, I go, men have been awful to women for hundreds of years, especially in this country. I get that. And there needs to be some shift in just dignity and respect. But don't fight for what men have been forced to do. Exactly. Because being a cog in a machine for a company that doesn't give one piss about you. Dude, totally. Is not what you want. Men had to do that. Right. So they right. suffered. And that is exactly why. Men commit suicide three to one more than women. Yeah, that's why men have depression, right? Like extraordinary levels higher than it's not a good thing. Being yeah. able to have a family and have them love you is like that's the problem with men more than the reason so many men are angry and so many men abuse people and so many men are violent and so many men are angry is because society has made them take on the role of being a cog in a wheel, whereas women were and it it shouldn't be. They were forced to do this, but don't shoot that. Don't cut off your nose for the sake of your face because having interaction with people who genuinely love you, who need you to live, and then having them worship at your altar till the day that you die and be there at your funeral is a lot better than working for a slaving for a company who literally doesn't know who you are. Bro, right? you're literally an employee ID number. I've said that many times in podcasts before. It literally, you can be the CEO, but at the end of the day, you are an employee ID number. Mm -hmm. And so. bottom line is all that matters. And to your kids, they don't give one. My daughter does not care one bit about anything, about performance, about how much money you can make her. It says she just wants to be with daddy. And that is a million times better than, than working the way it is. But societal roles are that and I still feel I still feel an immense pressure to be to make more money yeah and it's and not because we're not financially come not because my daughter can't eat because my male ego tells me like that's what I, I should be doing that's what a male that, that's that's basically what a male has been brainwashed to do to bring home the bacon mm -hmm. that's, that's 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 what we know and it never stops and you can't really take it out of you I mean I know we talked about balance but I mean to just at one point you know the whole transhumanism movement, mm. and there's a million ways to define it, is about anti-family. It's literally 
in teaching people, young people for the most part, because obviously older people are more discerning now and, and, and especially people that already have family members, but it's like teaching people that procreation is not important. Yeah. They, they want, I mean, let's just be honest, bro. Like the whole singularity is a man machine merge. They don't want organic humans any longer. They want less of us, more manageable, more hive minded, uh, less free thinkers, less independent thinkers. I mean, again, when I say they, I know we don't know who they is, but let's just call it the whoever the rulers are, the, the, the decision makers are, like you said, the people that are truly making decisions, if they're people or not. Uh, they, they want less of us, bro. The, right. the herd has gotten too big. It's, it's, and that's sad. It's sad because when you, when you actually take a step back and you, you, you get more to the nuts and bolts of it. And I've been really lucky, like moving away from an urban setting to yeah. a farm with lots of animals. Right. Yeah. And yeah. some are animals that are mine and a lot of them are invaders and yeah. I see how they interact and it, you, you get reminded really quickly, like, Oh, I'm just an I'm just an animal. That's right. I'm just I'm just like not only my great Pyrenees who are quite intellectual and they can piece things together, but I'm just like these chickens. Like I'm really the same. I, right. I can do math and I can drive a car. Right. So I have to, but I'm still I'm still a primate, you know. And and like I go away from my family all the time for reasons that I've been told to do. But like, I just want, I really, I'm much happier here, you know, providing for my family in, a, in an emotional way than I ever could be trying to. Bro, it's funny laugh. when you said that, because I, I know you know this now, but the animals have communication. The animals communicate amongst each other. They, they, they talk. I, I mean, like the other day we had this giant osprey, mm -hmm. you know, wild osprey that just came up to our lanai where I live here in Tampa. And it was, ah, ah. Ah, and my dog, my pet is out there. Like, you can't come here, yeah. you know, in his really menacing tone. And, and it's like, you know, we we just think that these are just animals making instinctual sounds, but they're communicating. Yep. Absolutely. I, we, we have, um, they just, in, in Brazil, uh, just this week, they took away the guard dogs out of prison and they replaced them with geese because the dogs would growl and and at anything that walked by they growl or they did they do of course attack the prisoners they were smart dogs but they would growl at so many things drive them a delivery guy that they didn't recognize it. the geese only barked when someone would try to escape and we got rah, rah, rah. and so then they come out with their guns and like whoa whoa what are you doing buddy um we have we have uh guinea fowl and we have turk chickens and we have the the goats and the donkeys and so like the the mammals live with the birds and but if I hear the guinea fowl making a certain noise, I'm like, there's a snake, there's a snake. And they're telling, if I hear the chickens making a certain noise, a big coyote, you know, they're, yeah. they're absolutely making, you know, the communication to each other. And then the, the chickens will alert the great Pyrenees, the great Pyrenees go over rawr, 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 and scare yeah. the, the coyote away. And it's, it's really a, a really elegant system. You know, you see it working. Bro, nature is balanced. All right. So before I let you go, mm -hmm. who do you want to impersonate? Who do you, do you want to be Rudy? I can go. I can go get my cousin Rudy if you'd like. Please get your cousin Rudy. <laughs> hey, what's up, dog? Hey, Rudy. What is up, my brother? Oh, you know, just like kicking back, dog. You know, it's life. It's crazy, right? How about the Lakers, man? You know, like, I don't, I don't even mess around, dog, with the Lakers no more because I'm all about the Dodgers full, you know, Shohei Otani. They're, they're shooting crazy feria at that full, and I feel like the Dodgers are maybe the greatest thing that's ever happened, dog. Bro, they're spending so much money on all these players, man, but they haven't won as many championships. No, nah, but, like, I'm an optimist. For most, like with my my wife's fupa, the Raiders and the Dodgers, I just you know I keep thinking like one of these days you know it'll get better. My wife's fupa will go away, her ass will get bigger. The Raiders will start winning. You know I just kind of keep a positive. You know you're all about positive vibrations. You know so I'm about yeah, positive man. ass vibrations. The, what about LeBron, man? What about your boy LeBron? He has janky feet, dog. You ever see his feet? 
I can't leave. Th- I can't even talk about nothing else than like I was smoking weed one day. I was looking and I saw this vato on TMZ Sports. His feet looked like a busted ass crack hole. And I was like, damn, fool, that, those feet jump and run off fast. But his toes are all like that under them. Rudy, is LeBron the best basketball player of all time? No, nah, the best basketball player, I hate to say this, fool, because, you know, I want to say it's Kobe or it's Shaq or, you know, Laker, you know. The best basketball player is Michael Jordan, and you're lying if you say otherwise. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, he could just make decisions. The way, Like, when you think about how many finals he went to and won all of like, that Vato went to the finals, he won. You know, no one else can say that. That's it's crazy. And then came back. He's like, I'm going to take a break and be shitty at baseball. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to win some work. That's insane, fool. What What about Fernando Valenzuela, man? The greatest uh, human. It's It goes like this. Virgin Mary Guadalupe. Fernando, Cheech and Chong, Cypress Hill. That's the, that's the hierarchy, fool. Cypress Hill. That's right. Me, like, they, uh, what about what about Ron Say and Steve Garvey, man? Oh, there. Let me tell you, Ron Say. First of all, beautiful, beautiful mustache dog is something clearly you know I can appreciate. Steve Garvey, I've never seen forearms like that. You could, he looked like Bill Kazmaier, fucking forearms coming out like his, and he would pull up his sleeves. I was like, damn, dog. I was like, damn, look at those far. I, I would imagine him doing reach around on me. And when he was blasting my culo, then <laughs> I get real happy. Harry, too, like like Alec Baldwin or some shit like that, or like an Armenian hyena. Oh, my God. Who's your favorite actor, Rudy? Of all time? Or like right now? Of all time? time? Cheech Marin. For sure. Davato Dope. Uh, Eva Mendez. For obvious reasons, um, Julia Roberts. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I watched Mystic Pizza the other night. I was crying like this. I was trying to hide it from my wife. A pretty woman when she comes out in the dress, all all pretty. I'm like, oh. And then she tells the hyena, put it on my credit card. I was like, oh, damn, she got her. You know what I'm saying, dude? Cheech and from dusk till dawn. The the line, oh, they fucking psychos. Cheech Marin. A lot of people don't know. It was a real vato, and he slangs a lot of dick still to this day. Danny Trejo, Danny Trejo, that vato. Oh, I love Danny, man. I met Danny a couple times in LA. He's a legit vato. He's like, he's legit. That vato doesn't fool around. Danny Trejo, holy shit. He's still alive, right? Oh, yeah, and he looks good. He's like 80 years old. People don't know that. He still looks good. Wow, yeah. I mean, he was like one of the most jacked dudes back back in the 80s and 90s. He was in all those movies, man. Yeah, because he was like literally in the pen, just pumping iron. It's true. No, that vato was in the jail for a long time, and for real, I heard he t- he said that uh, Robert De Niro helped get him clean. Like Robert De Niro came into wow. his his uh, his uh, trailer on heat, and he's like, you know, you can't be using drugs. Oh, and then he started stopped using drugs. Wow, amazing, very interesting how that shit works out. You know what I'm saying? That's my. I think that's my favorite movie of all time. Is he? You don't, don't ever get involved in anything you can't walk out of in ten seconds flat. And that's how I feel about children. I got. I got. It. As soon as that that Heine comes back, she's like, "Oh, I'm like two weeks late." I'm like, "Oh, that's crazy." I'm out. I already have my bag packed. You could cut that part out, right? Because I got ladies. All they don't want. They don't even know where I'm at, fool. Rudy, I will have my podcast team edit that out, man. I appreciate Thank I appreciate you, you so much for coming out, on, man. Good looking out. Thank you, my brother. Right, I'm about I got a I got a blunt still burning. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Frank brother, Harvey, like, that was absolutely profound. profound. There was some ruse I was pulling on people. No, that was absolutely profound. I'm not editing that. It's absolutely hilarious. Man, let me uh let me just give you the last last words. Uh, as you guys can see, this is a man of incredible talents and very close personal friend and very smart, may I add, that you left L.A. Uh, but dude, was it three years ago now or two years ago? It was uh, a little over two. Yeah, I, 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 it was like summer 2021. Smart man. Smart man. Yeah, I, I mean, I still love L.A. It's like I'm not like a lot of people who leave a 
you know, urban area and they come to the country town and they, and they want to talk crap about all. Yeah. I no, love it. I just, I just, I feel like it was untenable. I really do. I feel like it was untenable and more so than anything you could talk about, oh, the taxes and this, no, but is, uh, people are lying. They say money doesn't matter. The yeah. biggest thing, the biggest factor for me and especially for my wife was like, I was so tired of the state of California screwing with my daughter. Same with me. Same. Telling them how she has to live her life. I was like, wait, what? I was like, I actually kind of like the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm yeah, no, we did the same thing, dude. I mean, that's why I sent my daughters to Florida and me and Monica moved to Mexico. And, you know, we lasted 10 months in Mexico. I mean, I still love Mexico with every fiber of my being, but it's just so difficult to purchase property in Mexico. And it's, and it's still like, like, let's not kid ourselves. It's so, and it's sad, but it's so freaking dangerous. Even in good neighborhoods, like the- Yeah, no, like, it is. The uh, insane asylum is run by the the inmates in, in Mexico, you know? That's the only that's the only benefit that you know as still has is that you have some sustainability from a standpoint of like you don't have to like go to bed every single night thinking that something bad might happen. No, and people uh and especially people with different lifestyles of mine have their fundamental problems with cops. And I get you know, yeah. I get that. And everyone's free they should be feel free to express themselves. Yep. But let's not again, it was what you talked about at the very beginning, the extremes kind of running the norm. Don't get crazy because you don't know how good you have it in this country that even in crappy neighborhoods, like, of course, it's better in yeah. better neighborhoods. But you call the cops in the U.S. of A because there's crime committed or you feel scared. Cops show up. Yeah, they don't rob you and they don't. You know what I'm saying? Like that is it's so beautiful. And I don't think if you haven't had experience with the alternative, you realize how amazing it is. Yeah, no, it's 100 percent true, man. Let me throw up your uh, IG. Yeah. Um, so guys, obviously guys and gals that come on this podcast, I mean, follow Mike. I mean, he's got Rudy's also got a, uh, an IG. You guys saw Rudy Kulo breaker. That's what, that's what that, that's Mike's alter ego. He's got others, but, uh, I'm dude, I'm so grateful you came on the show today. This was a really, truly profound podcast. Anytime. 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 Okay, I'll give you the last that. word though. Like, you know, just words of wisdom for 2024 and beyond. I, uh, I care. I care. Genuinely care about people. I like people. That's another thing is like, I think that helps a lot of times is like, I enjoy humans and I think a lot more people do than like to admit that they yep. think there's something cool or beneficial to being like, oh, I'm a, I'm this isolating brooding person. And it's like, no, no, I love humans and I, I give a crap and I know so many are suffering in it. Uh, and, uh, that's why I, I have such a for people like you. And I, like I said, I, any, anything you ever wanted from me, I would be happy to do. The feeling is mutual, brother. I love you and I appreciate you. So guys and gals, uh, please support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Follow Mike on IG and remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.